So as Keith mentioned, today I'm going to talk about uh, considering what conditions we should use mycorrhizal inoculum to restore our forests. And when I'm talking about restoring our forests, I'm obviously talking about um, those that have been disturbed by mountain pine beetle. Uh, before I talk about my research, I want to first acknowledge my co-authors, and I will start with Nadir Erbelgen. So most of you know, uh, or probably associate Nadir with insects and maybe above ground tree chemistry, but I have proof here in this photo um, that he's digging for roots. And so not only does Nadir study the above ground parts of trees, but he also studies the below ground parts. Um, and he and I together have learned a lot about the ectomycorrhizal ecology of roots in the past few years working together. So, so yes, uh, Nadir and roots. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Josh Wazilu and Evan Felrath, who really led most of the research I'm going to talk about today. And then we've also collaborated with various members of my lab, uh, graduate students and postdocs, including James Franklin, uh, Greg Peck, John Kale, uh, and Charlotte Thomason. I'd like to thank our field assistants, Chloe Christensen, Dana Hopoff, Cole Burns, and Joseph Cooper. Uh, Ellen McDonald and Julia Stunke were really helpful in helping us find sites for our research. Thanks so much to FRI Research for supporting our funding or funding our research. And uh, thanks so much to all of you for coming out today to, to listen to my presentation. So as you know, um, mountain pine beetle is a novel disturbance in some parts of Alberta. And because it's a novel disturbance, this means that predictions for forest recovery uh, can be unclear. And as an Ellen McDonald showed us last week that in for many of these beetle killed stands, there is uh, a limit or the logical pine regeneration is limited. And because of this issue, this is sort of the issue that we've been focusing on in our research and asking the question of if it's possible to increase pine seedling establishment in these beetle killed stands. And to address this issue, we have been using, um, as Keith mentioned, uh, mostly a below ground perspective. And so in our prior research, we were very interested in how tree mortality caused by mountain pine beetle uh, changed below ground fungal communities. And the fungi that we are really interested in are these ectomycorrhizal fungi. Ectomycorrhizal fungi, they colonize fine roots of uh, trees, including pine, and they form associations with most of the tree species in the boreal forest. Ectomycorrhizal fungi are very good at acquiring resources, so nutrients, water from the soil, and they transfer some of those nutrients to their living tree hosts. The living tree hosts, they photosynthesize and they produce sugars and they transfer some of those sugars to ectomycorrhizal fungi. So they're considered uh, usually a mutualism. So why we're so interested in ectomycorrhizal fungi in this beetle killed system is because Ectomycorrhizal fungi, we know that they're critical to the survival and growth of pines in general, and specifically lodgepole pine. So for this is one example, and, and there are many. Um, here's an example where researchers uh, try to translocate individuals of lodgepole pine to New Zealand. So New Zealand obviously didn't have any lodgepole pine, and these individuals, pine individuals, would not grow until their ectomycorrhizal fungi were provided. So they were moved to a region that was essentially devoid of ectomycorrhizal fungi and needed them to be able to establish. And actually in this example, the lodgepole pine did so well when they were provided their ectomycorrhizal fungi that be, they became invasive in New Zealand grasslands. So we know that ectomycorrhizal fungi are critically important for pine survival and growth. And on the flip side, we know that ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, require a living tree host. And so it's based on this relationship that initially we hypothesized that in living pine stands, so these are ones that had not been disturbed by a mountain pine beetle, we would expect to see a diversity of fungal communities. So th this would include saprotrophic fungi. These are fun fungal species that degrade dead organic matter to get their carbon. And it would also include, of course, our ectomycorrhizal fungi. So in our living pine stands, we expected this diverse community of ectomycorrhizal fungi. 
when mountain pine beetle came through, of course, mountain pine beetle then kills trees. And when they kill a lot of trees in a stand, we expected that to effectively uh, shut off the transfer of carbon or sugars from the living trees to supporting these below ground ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so we expected to see a loss of ectomycorrhizal fungi in mountain pine beetle killed stands and a change in the fungal community composition. And in turn, this change in the composition and loss of ectomycorrhizal fungi, we thought would probably be detrimental to the establishment of lodgepole pine seedlings in these beetle killed stands. And this is exactly what we found in our previous research. So what we did is we um, found 11 pine stands and they captured a gradient of tree mortality caused by mountain pine beetle. And so you can see this gradient on the x-axis. It's represented by the amount of lodgepole pine killed in percent basal area. So it runs from zero to 100. And what we did is we surveyed these stands for spore carps. So spore carps are just mushrooms. They're the above ground fruiting um, structure of fungi. And we categorized the spore carps as either being saprotrophic or ectomycorrhizal uh, fungal. And what we found is across this tree mortality gradient that in our intact stands over here, there was about, so 60% of the spore carps were ectomycorrhizal. And then as you move along this gradient in tree mortality, we saw a loss of ectomycorrhizal fungi. So in our stands that had high levels of tree mortality, there was only about 10% of the spore carps that were ectomycorrhizal. We then also complemented this research uh, doing, so here an above ground survey of mushrooms, but we also surveyed the soils and found a similar story that along this gradient of tree mortality, we see a very pronounced shift in the composition of ectomycorrhizal fungal communities. We then wanted to know um, what effect this might have on pine seedling establishment along this gradient of tree mortality. And so we sowed seeds of lodgepole pine into each of these 11 stands. And I'm just gonna focus on the extreme ends of the gradient here. So in our undisturbed pine stands, we found that seedling survival was about 25%. And that compared to seedling survival in our stands that um, had high levels of tree mortality, the seedling survival was quite a bit lower, it was only 1%. And you can see here from this picture that there's a lot of differences between these two stands. So the trees are killed, obviously, but there's gonna be changes in light. There's gonna be changes in the soil conditions. And what we wanted to do was really isolate the effect of the soil biota in underlying this trend that we're seeing, this, this big difference in the seedling establishment between our undisturbed stands and those that um, had extensive tree mortality. So what we did is we set up a greenhouse experiment and we grew seedlings of lodgepole pine and then we inoculated them with small amounts of soil from uh, different stand types. So here I'll, I'll walk you through our experiment. So we had some lodgepole pine seedlings that did not receive any soil inoculum. They were our control seedlings. And then we had some lodgepole pine seedlings that are inoculated with small amounts of soil that we collected from our beetle killed stands. And then we also had seedlings that were inoculated from soil from intact uh, living pine stands. And what you can see is that the seedlings that did not receive any soil inoculum, so they did very poorly. So on the y-axis here, this is seedling mass. And this, um, so they did very, very poorly without any soil inoculum. And this effect, when you have seedlings uh, respond very poorly with, because they don't have any mycorrhizas, compared to seedlings that do have mycorrhizas, you see this over and over again in greenhouse studies. This is a very, very common result. Um, but what we found was very interesting was that seedlings that received soil inoculum from our living pine stands grew better than those seedlings that were inoculated with soil from beetle killed stands. So in the amount of the soil that we add is very small. So it's not changing the abiotic conditions of the pots. It's just adding a little bit of life into those pots. And that little bit of life varies depending on the origin of the soil. So here in this experiment, so we isolated the effect of the soil biota. Then we wanted to know, you know, what, what was going on? Were there certain fungal species that might be responsible or underline the differences we see in seedling growth in this uh, greenhouse experiment? So what we did is that we um, scored roots 
for mycorrhizal colonization, and then also assess them to see which fungal species were colonizing their roots. And what we found is that seedlings that were inoculated with soil from beetle killed stands, they had roots that were mostly colonized by taxa belonging to this, this order, Holoshiales. Seedlings that were um, inoculated with soil from living pine stands, their roots had fewer of these particular taxa belonging to these Holoshiales. So this order, Holoshiales, it is, um, it is these species can be ectomycorrhizal, but in some circumstances, they can behave more like parasites. So taken together from our previous research, we knew that along our tree mortality gradient, we saw a shift in the composition of the ectomycorrhizal fungal communities. We knew that seedling establishment was much poorer in our beetle killed stands compared to our intact stands. When we moved it into the greenhouse and isolated the effect of the soil biota, it seemed that we could build an argument that mycorrhizal fungi or soil fungi in general seem to be playing a role in um, the performance of these seedlings in these beetle killed stands. So this brings us to uh, the new research that I wanna talk about today is we then wondered, is it possible to rescue these seedlings that are establishing in beetle killed stands? Can we restore the fungi on their roots to the extent that they do better when they're establishing in these beetle killed stands? The second question that we asked in our new research um, was extending our research uh, beyond those 11 stands. So the tree mortality gradient that we initially set up with our 11 stands, those stands were all on loamy soils. And we know that lodgepole pine has a much, it has a fairly wide ecological amplitude. And so we wanted to consider other soil types and test that out. So basically we wanted to uh, stretch our, our realm of inference by considering other soil types in addition to the loamy soils that we had in our previous study. So to tackle this question, so does mycorrhizal inoculation improve seedling success in beetle killed stands? We have a few options in how we might be able to manipulate ectomycorrhizal fungal communities on seedling roots. So the first way that we could do this is we could culture fungi of different species and grow it up and use it as inoculum and put that on our seedlings. Here's a picture of, you can see different fungal species and they're growing um, on these Petri plates. You don't have to use Petri plates. You can use liquid media, you can use spores. There's different ways of doing this. Um, but there are a lot of questions that you have to tackle to, to be able to do this. So first of all, what fungal species do you use? Is it culturable? Um, and you need to have specialized facilities to set this up. And you need to have some special skills to be able to culture these fungi and then to be using them as inoculum. So we didn't use this approach um, because we were looking for something a little bit easier for this first pass. Um, I know that makes me sound a little bit lazy. Um, so this first one, so our first method that we could choose, we could culture fungi and use that as inoculum. I have a little sad face because like I said, it, it's a lot of work and uh, we didn't want to try that right away. The next approach that we could use, and this has been used in restoring grasslands, is where we transfer soils from a donor site and often the donor site will be say a target e ecosystem, a mature, a mature ecosystem, a reference ecosystem, something, the ecosystem that you're striving for. So you take soil from that donor site and you move it to your recipient site, which in this case would say be our beetle killed stands. And so as I mentioned, so this has been done um, to restore grasslands and they have had actually very good success. So they'll take soil, transfer it to their restored site, and that soil transfer actually can direct the successional trajectory of those sites in a way that is desirable. And it's not just because of the seeds, the plant seeds that are carried over with that soil transfer. Uh, people have isolated it to be largely an effect of soil microbes. So this technique has been applied elsewhere with success. And we also wanted to try this in, in our um, beetle killed system. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about this today, except um, to point out, so this was the focus of John Rodriguez Ramos' uh, PhD thesis that he just defended about a month ago. So if you're interested in the details, you could, you could go to his thesis. And so this is what he did. He transferred soil 
from an attacked living pine stand to a beetle killed stand and then planted lodgepole pine seedlings and then followed them after a year or two. And what he found is that the resident soil fungi in those beetle killed stands were very resistant to the soil transfer. So you could bring some soil in, but it really didn't change the mycorrhizal fungal community in those beetle killed uh, stands in the soils. The other thing that he found is that the soil transfer had no effect on seedling success in those beetle killed stands. Okay, so we tried the transfer soils, didn't have a lot of success. So the last thing that we could try is actually using soil, small amounts of soil, to inoculate seedlings and then transplant those inoculated seedlings out to the field. So this is reminiscent of the greenhouse experiment I talked about a few minutes ago, where we grow seedlings, we inoculate them with small amounts of soil that we collect from the field, and then let them grow and then transplant those out to the field. And this is what I'm gonna talk about now for the next few minutes. So here we are, um, we have grown our lodgepole seedlings uh, in a growth chamber and one third of them, we inoculated them with soil that we collected from intact living pine stands. And again, we're just talking just a small, small amount of soil, um, like a few milliliters kind of worth. One third of the seedlings we inoculated with soil that we collected from our beetle killed stands. And then finally, one third of the seedlings, we did not apply any inoculum at all. So we applied the inoculum and then we let the seedlings grow for four months in this growth chamber. After four months, we assessed them. First, we wanted to see if they were colonized by mycorrhizal fungi. And we confirmed that those seedlings that did not receive an inoculum, they were not colonized, they're free of mycorrhizal fungi. And those seedlings that did receive some soil inoculum were colonized by um, ectomycorrhizal fungi, but kind of low levels, I would say about 15%. The other thing that we did is we um, identified the fungi on the roots of these seedlings. And what we found actually, was there was not huge differences in the fungal community on the roots of the seedlings that received soil inoculum from the intact stand versus the seedlings that received soil from our beetle killed stands. What we did find was that the survival of seedlings that were inoculated with soil from beetle killed stands was the highest of our three inoculation treatments. So I just want you to just pause for a second because remember in our previous greenhouse experiment, what we found was the opposite. We found that seedlings that were inoculated with soil from intact stands, they grew the best. Here we're finding a different trend. So I guess one message is sometimes when you do your experiments over again, you actually do find different results. So just kind of keep this in mind. So we have an effect of uh, soil inoculation, you know, after four months in the greenhouse. But really the question is, so what happens when we transfer these seedlings out to the field? So first of all, we had to pick field sites. So where are we going to move all these inoculated seedlings to? And what we did is we initially sampled uh, 30 candidate sites around Grand Prairie. So all of these sites are beetle killed sites. They all um, had greater than 70% of the pine killed by mountain pine beetle in these stands. Um, the mountain pine beetle, the trees had died, I would say all kind of within um, 10 years. And you know there was some variation in that. Uh, but what we did, so then we surveyed these 30 beetle killed sites and we um, had the soils measured for soil texture, nutrients, and we also uh, characterize the fungal communities in these soils. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to find sites that were quite distinct from the initial sites that we use in our tree mortality gradient. So those were loamy soils. And so we wanted to find uh, sites that were quite distinct in soil type. And so what we ended up doing is, so we surveyed these 30 candidate sites and we selected 15 of those sites for transplanting our inoculated seedlings into. The sites that we ended up with, so we had uh, six boreal, what we're calling boreal sandy sites. And so here's Grand Prairie. They're mostly north uh, east of Grand Prairie. And these sites, the soils all had greater than 80% sand, so very, very sandy soils. And we found um, 
nine sites that were loamy soils down here in the lower foothills. And these soils had about 45% silt, so quite different soil textures. Um, please note, I recognize that our soil types are in two different regions of the province. So again, we were trying to find sites that were quite distinct from each other, uh, that were very separated in soil texture. So the soil type is replicated, but of course that's gonna be conflated with region. So these sandy soils are very different in texture than these soils down here, but there are likely to be some regional differences between these types as well. Right, okay, and yes, and I wanted to mention, uh, so the sandy sites, they're still quite far apart from one another though. On average, they're about 24 kilometers apart. These ones down here on average are about 10 kilometers apart. Just to orient yourself, this is uh, Musrow Lake right there, and of course, Grand Prairie. Okay, so we had our sites picked out. We have our inoculated seedlings. We then transplanted our seedlings out to the sites. Um, here's a, some pictures so you can see what these look like. Here's an example of one of our sandy sites. So at each site, we set up two plots. And here's an example of one plot. And each plot was divided into four squares. And each square received uh, seedlings of a particular inoculation type. So say this square would have been planted with seedlings receiving soil inoculum from beetle kill sites. Uh, this square would have been seedlings receiving soil inoculum from attack stands. And then maybe these are none. This fourth square we just seeded with lodgepole pine seeds, but I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Here, so you can see that we cleared the vegetation and we removed the organic matter from that top litter layer from the soils. And we did that because we were very interested in the effect of soil type. So first of all, so we're very interested in the effect of inoculation on these seedlings um, in response to our particular soil type. So we wanted to remove the effects of competition of any differences in light and really just focus on the influence of soil type combined with inoculation. So here's an example of a sandy site. Down here is an example of one of our loamy sites. And so here is a nice picture. You can see that they're very different in terms of water holding capacity, for example. Oh, and I should mention that, so this, we, um, we built these trenches in between the squares so that roots couldn't cross over, so you couldn't have any sort of mixing of the inoculation treatment. We then let these seedlings grow in the field for two years. So here is just a picture of one of our two-year-old seedlings. And then after two years, we harvested the seedlings. Um, we took measurements, survival, height, biomass, and then we took the roots out as well as part of the harvesting. And I should note, so when we, um, harvested the roots, the root systems of an individual tree or seedling was, were separate. So um, these the seedlings, you can consider them independent in terms of, of how they grew. The roots weren't all mixed together. There was still a lot of space um, among the seedlings. So we harvested roots and then we sequenced DNA from roots to characterize the fungal communities on those roots. Okay. So just to convince you that our site selection worked and that we got very different uh, soil types with our planting sites, here is a principal compo components analysis. The dark, the closed triangles, they correspond to our sandy sites and the open circles, they correspond to our loamy sites. And you can see there's a very nice separation between site type. The sandy sites, of course, are dominated by sand. They're also high in phosphate. The loamy sites are dominated by higher fractions of clay and silt, and they are higher, were higher in ammonium. So here, so yes, the sites differed in soil texture and nutrients. The sites, the soils of these sites also differed in their fungal community composition. So here is an NMDS down here, so it's an ordination. And this is built on um, the fungal community composition that we saw observed in soils. And so this is based on ITS1 sequences of the RDNA of fungi. And um, we, we focused on symbiotic fungi occurring in soil. So this would be ectomycorrhizal fungi, uh, endophytic, and pathogenic. 
um, but know that most of the sequences were ectomycorrhizal, that they dominate the soils in this system. So again, we can see that there's this nice split between sandy and loamy soils. So the fungal community composition differed between the two soil types. And this is visualized in this bar plot over here. On the y-axis, so this is abundance of different genera of ectomycorrhizal fungi. And then our two site types are loamy soils and our sandy soils. And then here, the ectomycorrhizal fungi, fungal genera are just color coded. So you can see that there's lots of different kinds. And what should pop out at you is so the difference in fungal community composition um, was really linked to the change in this, this pink square, which is uh, tomatella, and this beige square here, tilospora. So there was a lot more. Uh, fungi belonging to these genera in the sandy soils versus the loamy. And in the loamy soils, we saw a higher abundance of these Xenococcum fungi. So all this to say is that our sites differed in soil texture and nutrients, and they also differed in fungal community composition. When we looked at um, the fungi associated with roots, of course, we're interested in the inoculation treatments. So did they have a long lasting effect? Were we able to manipulate the fungal communities in, way, in some way? So remember back in the greenhouse I reported, so there was no difference in the amount of colonization between seedlings that received some type of soil inoculum. And we didn't actually see very strong differences in the fungal communities at the greenhouse stage. So now we're looking at them two years later in the field. And what we found, okay, so here is a, another ordination. Here's an NMDS, and this is um, arranging um, seedlings based on soil type and the, fun, the fungi associated with their roots. And so the sandy sites, again, are closed triangle, loamy, open circles. And now we have this layer of our inoculation treatments. Soils that were inoculated with soil from our beetle killed stands are represented in red. Seedlings that, um, sorry, that should be seedlings that were inoculated with the beetle killed soils. Seedlings that did not receive an inoculum, these are blue. Seedlings that received inoculum from our intact living stands, so this is kind of this, this blackish green color here. Okay, so first you'll notice that again, the fungal communities that we find on roots are separated by soil type. You can see a split between the circles and the triangles. And also what we see is that those seedlings that received soil inoculum from our intact living pine stands had different fungal communities than those receiving soil from the beetle killed stands and the control. That's probably the strongest difference that we see in inoculation. And again, I have this visualized over here in this bar plot you can see the abundance of uh, the different fungal genera, ectomycorrhizal fungal genera on the Y, and then our three inoculation treatments. So in which should stand out right away to you is that seedlings that received soil inoculum from our intact living stands, they have a lot more of this gray bar, which corresponds to this general Wilcoxina. And that is probably um, the most stand out difference among the seedlings two years uh, past inoculation. And again, the fungal communities between the seedlings that were inoculated uh, with soil from beetle attack stands and control, they were actually you know, kind of similar two years post um, transplanting. Okay, so now we know that, so the inoculation seems to have some long lasting effect in, um, we can say that we were able to manipulate or what we did in the greenhouse somehow manipulated the fungal community two years down the road uh, when we looked at the seedlings in the soil. But of course, the big question is, is does it matter? Does it have an effect? And recall from our greenhouse study, actually the two greenhouse studies I talked about, we saw a strong effect of the type of soil inoculum, where it came from, and it, it affected the growth, it affected the survival of seedlings. But the question is, does it really, um, what happens out in the field? What, do we still see this effect? And I'm hopefully building a little bit of suspense here. <laughs> so is it maintained? And so now I have to say, no, it actually vanishes. So that effect that we see in the greenhouse, that soil inoculum effect that we see so strongly in the greenhouse, we don't see it in the field. And so uh, to me, this is a lesson to always test your greenhouse results out in the field. 
Um, okay, but here I, I will go through the different seedling performance metrics one by one. Okay, so first I wanna talk about seedling survival. And what I have plotted here is the mean plus or minus a 95% confidence interval. And then the inoculation treatments um, are color coded the same. So seedlings that receive soil from beetle killed stands, red. Seedlings that received no inoculum, control, blue. Seedlings that received a soil inoculum from intact living stands, this blackish green color. And here I've plotted survival uh, in two time periods, 2018, this is one year after transplanting, 2019, two years after transplanting. And then so survival on the y-axis and then our soil type on the x-axis. You can see that for both years, survival is higher in sandy, uh, sandy sites compared to loamy sites. Two years after transplanting, seedling survival in our sandy sites was about 60%. And then the seedling survival in our loamy sites was about 20%. But no, no effect of inoculation on seedling survival in these beetle killed stands. Turning to height, seedling height. So again, I have it um, sectioned off by year, one year, two years following transplanting. You can see, so one year after transplanting, there is no effect of soil type and no effect of inoculation one year after transplanting. Two years after transplanting, same thing, no effect of soil type and no effect of inoculation. You can see over time that seedling height becomes more variable, um, but that's sort of the only trend. So after two years, on average, the seedlings were about 10 centimeters tall. Oops. Okay, and then finally for shoot biomass, of course, uh, this the shoot biomass is the last year. So this is two years after the seedlings have uh, been transplanted. And you can see, so no effect of inoculation. Seedlings in loamy soils had lower shoot biomass than soils grown in sandy sites. Um, and then of course, the other thing you probably notice is that shoot biomass is much more variable in sandy sites than loamy sites. So then, okay, so it's clear that soil type has a very pronounced influence on the seedlings and soil inoculation, not so much. And then we wondered though, if there was something about the fungal communities in the sandy sites that might be different than those in the loamy sites, maybe there's still something about the fungal community that might help explain this huge difference um, in growth and survival between the soil types. And what we reasoned, so remember um, back to our initial tree mortality gradient, was that in stands with high levels of tree mortality, we saw this change in the fungal communities and soils. And it seemed to be a change that was detrimental to the, the seedlings. So we thought maybe in our loamy sites here in this current experiment that um, it might be possible that seedlings were not able to escape the fungal communities in loamy soils, and maybe for some reason they were able to escape um, the fungal communities in the sandy soils. And so the way that we looked at this or assessed this is we compared the fungal communities that we found on the seedling roots, so the fungal community composition, and we compared that to the fungal community that we found resident in the surrounding soils for that plot, for example. And we compared the fungal community composition between roots and soils, and we calculated a dissimilarity um, index. So if the communities were very different, say like in this case, this would be considered high dissimilarity. If the communities between roots and soils were very similar, then we would say that this has low dissimilarity. And just to remind you, we're working on um, DNA sequences, right, to, to characterize these fungal communities. And so again, we hypothesized that maybe somehow the seedlings were able to escape the soil fungi present in our sandy soils, but maybe not able to uh, escape the fungi present in our loamy soils. So we tested this prediction and uh, we found, no, that wasn't the case. So first of all, um, here on the y-axis, this is the average Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. So again, this is the dissimilarity in fungal community composition between roots and soils. You'll see um, across the site types and inoculation treatments, it's, it's quite high. So the fungal community that you find on roots is quite different than the fungal community that you find in soils. But that difference in similarity 
um, well, there is no difference in dissimilarity between seedlings growing in loamy sites and sandy sites and no difference across our inoculation treatments. So this, the dissimilarity between soil and root fungal communities did not explain differences in seedling success between our loamy sites and our sandy sites. Okay, so I wanna kinda loop back to our main question and answer um, our question. Under what conditions should we use mycorrhizal inoculum to restore our forest? And so again, we are focusing on our beetle killed stands. And what we found is that the effect of soil inoculation did not differ between the two soil types. So there is no difference in when we applied the soil inoculation, whether it was a sandy type or a loamy soil type. Um, but importantly, I think probably what the main message is, is, is that inoculation of seedlings with soil uh, was not successful in altering the seedling success in these types of beetle killed stands. And then just a reminder, remember we tried this other approach where we transferred soil from donor sites, intact pine stands, to recipient sites, beetle killed stands, and we also did not have success in um, changing the success of or altering seedling establishment in these stands. So two different approaches, um, and we didn't find that inoculation in these two different ways affected seedling success in these beetle killed stands. Okay, so then that brings us to the next steps. And I will be honest, and I have stared at this slide for hours thinking, you know, what, what are the next steps? What do we do next? What could we try next? And first of all, so I wanna make the point that even though, okay, so we tried soil inoculation uh, and we tried it in different ways and it didn't influence um, seedling performance in these beetle killed stands. But I really wanna emphasize that this does not mean that mycorrhizal fungi are not critical to seedling establishment. And by no means am, do I want to send the message that mycorrhizal fungi are not important. That, that is just not the case. What we show is that trying to manipulate soil fungal communities in these two ways, it didn't influence seedling establishment or seedling performance. And so what I think her research actually shows is that these fungal communities are complex and extremely diverse. And this makes them both resistant to change and difficult to manipulate without applying a lot of force. Forces like beetles killing many of the trees in the stand or drastically changing soil types. Those kinds of forces change the mycorrhizal community composition to the extent that it does affect seedling performance. So we could go back and we might consider, um, you know, could we try this approach? Could we culture species of fungi and use that as inoculum? And there might be some promise in inoculated seedlings with cultured fungi. And, you know, it has worked in systems that are often devoid of ectomycorrhizal fungi, but this beetle killed system is not that kind of system. So instead, I'm kind of leaning towards managing ectomycorrhizal fungal communities at the stand level. So if you want to change the composition of ectomycorrhizal fungal communities to the extent that it's affecting seedling performance, you are probably not sprinkling soil on seedlings, but instead applying some kind of treatments that are affecting the entire stands. And so what I'm trying to stay, say in conclusion is that you can take the fungi out of the forest, but you can't take the forest out of the fungi. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>